is the festive season, so I thought, why not double down on dynamite guests? We have the satiny smooth sounds of Bassmaster host Tommy Sanders, as well as the youngest Bassmaster Classic qualifier in history, 17-year-old Aaron Yavorsky, both joining me this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome on, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. You guys know the drill. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Welcome into episode 141 of this particular podcast. And I welcome all of my humpers that listen week after week. And hopefully, once again, we put a little hump back in your hump day. Welcome in, all of you, and uh, if I seem a little bit more jovial and, and excited this week, it's because I am. I'm literally, um, I'm, I'm having a good week. I mean, not only is it Christmas, and we're going to talk a lot about that, but it's my birthday, and um, I got to thank all of you that took the time to send messages, whether it be through DMs, whether it be through social posts, whether it be through texts, whether it be through phone calls. I thank all of you um, for celebrating my birthday. Um, it was a big one. It was, I, I, I'm 50. I, I don't know how that happened. I mean, I honestly feel like I'm, I'm about a 22 year old. That's just very follically challenged. Now, I mean, I'll be honest. I think I'm probably mentally, well, mentally I might be less, but I think I'm kind of, just so you know, I feel like I'm 25. I literally do. I mean, I look in the mirror and I can tell that I am older but I, I really just, that's, I'm holding it 25, basically. But I'm proud to be 50. Um, I'm just starting to figure out some things. I mean, when I was a little kid, I remember thinking, one day I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be an adult like my parents. And now that I've grown up and have kids of my own, I realize there's no such thing as adults. It's all just big kids that act like adults in front of their kids. And, um, I mean, fart jokes are still funny to me. They were funny when I was nine and they're funny when I'm 50. Um, so anyways, thank you all for making it so special. Um, outside of posts and everything, um, my wife and family and friends, um, had a surprise party for me and I cannot thank them enough for that. It was, uh, it's an experience that I hope everybody gets to feel in their lifetime, you know, to be surrounded by that many people that, that you love and care for. Um, it was just very, very cool, very shocking. It's hard to pull something off on me because I'm allegedly, I, I guess gifts and I'm not good, but they, they got me. I mean, uh, as if it wasn't shocking enough. I mean, it was a banger, banger party. I mean, thank you all of you that hung tight till the wee hours in the morning. Um, the Van Dam showed up from Michigan. If that isn't the greatest flex, greatest surprise ever, or the greatest friendship ever, I mean, I thank them for that. I thank everybody that took the time to make this old guy feel special. So thank you all. I don't often talk about personal stuff like that, but uh, I just thought I would publicly thank everybody because it was freaking awesome. Um, obviously, everybody celebrating many things this week. It is Christmas. If whether what do you celebrate? Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is you celebrate, I wish you happiness and a bountiful festive season and a great new year ahead. Um, this show is going to be a fun one. We've we've got two guests this week. Uh, we're going to kick it off with a short interview with Aaron Yavorsky, who is the youngest Bassmaster Classic qualifier ever, seventeen years old. And he beat, uh, I think, about 500 adults, mainly adults, to make it to the Bassmaster Classic. So we talked to him for a little while, and it's fun to get to know him. Um, and then I am joined by somebody who is one of the people, like I said on last week's show, I kind of teased this week's show and said, he's somebody who I like to talk to, one of the people who I cherish every moment I talk to with him. He is truly a legend in our sport. He's a Bass Fishing Hall of Famer. He is... Um, so, so good at his job. His voice takes you places. I always say that to him. You know, I hear him talk, and, and last time he was on the show, I actually had him do some Dr. Seuss. Well, we, we have a very special ending to this show. 
that you need to stick around for. It is a festive ending to this show that I think you'll all enjoy and cherish for years and years to come. And it is none other than Tommy Sanders. Um, Tommy doesn't do a lot of interviews. He doesn't do a lot of this kind of thing. I mean, Tommy's a very kind of kind of a private guy, I guess. You know, he, he, he's he's so humble, but he is so skilled, so talented, and Bass would not be what it is without Tommy Sanders. Trust me. Tommy Sanders, there's a bunch of boneheads like myself, Zona, Davey Height, Ronnie, Such, all of us. Tommy Sanders takes all of that and pulls us together and makes it a somewhat cohesive unit. And if it wasn't for Tommy, none of that would happen. So I thank Tommy Sanders. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. But before we talk to Tommy, we're going to talk to this 17-year-old kid that just made the Bassmaster Classic. When I was 17 years old, well, I was a lot like I am now. I was just a big fish bum, but I had, to, I mean, I'd never been to a classic. I mean, this kid's going to fish the Bassmaster Classic, and it's got a lot of people in the fishing industry saying, just who in the world is Aaron Yavorsky? Well, let's find out. Aaron Yavorsky? I'm saying it right, right? Yes, sir. You were the youngest person in history, in, in, in Bassmaster history, to ever qualify for the Bassmaster Classic. Has that sunk in yet? No, not yet. Um, It was uh, getting to me a little bit, reading up on some of the info and everything that Bass sent me, but um, I don't know if it'll sink in until I'm actually there. I mean, everybody in the fishing world was was all excited about the youth movement. I'm sure if you followed the Opens, I mean, the youngest qualifying rookie class in in Elite Series history, but you just made all those dudes seem like old men. I mean, 17 years old. Do you even have a driver's license? I do. Uh, only had it for about a year, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. When did this dream start? I mean, any, I, I think... I think this dream, you know, the dream of being in the Bassmaster Classic and everything, I mean, I don't even know if this is even realistic for you. Like, did you ever imagine that at 17 years, yeah, I'd like to fish one one day, but did you ever imagine you'd be the youngest ever? Yeah, I, I didn't even, I mean, just with how hard it is just to make it there, you know, it's always been a dream just to make it, but to do it, you know, as the youngest person in history, it's just really unreal. <laughs> The classic is the bit you, yeah, and I hear you've never been to a classic, right? Correct. Well, I mean, might as well win the first one you go to, right? We're gonna try. <laughs> how did you pull off what you pulled off? Because I think a lot of people see how young you are, and maybe in a lot of their heads, you know, he was in a collegiate competition, a high school competition. I mean, you beat adults from all around the world literally the world i mean there's canadians there people from all over the place at the team championship to do this how did you do that um honestly <laughs> i don't really know but i mean it's uh we had it on the harris chain obviously and it's somewhere where i fish you know pretty regularly just from being in florida are you Sorry, getting again. blowing up Getting a phone call right now, sorry. Um, but, you know, we had it on the Harris chain, somewhere where I regularly fish, and um, it was just kind of kind of one of them deals where you just, like, you know, we had qualified for the tournament, and we were just like, man, it'd be crazy, you know, if we just – if if we won and made the classic, you know, on, on a lake that we, we always usually fish. And, um, I mean, we were, we were just thinking about it before we even got to the tournament, and it's crazy that it just happened, you know. So what is the, you know, it's been about a week now. So going back to school and everything, did, did it make any ripples or do people in school not even know what Bassmaster Classic is? Yeah. Um, most of the people at my school, they don't really understand the whole fishing thing. But, you know, a lot of the buddies I have from around here in Florida, they were all congratulating me and showing a bunch of support. So I appreciate that for them. Obviously. Um, it is the Super Bowl of bass fishing. What uh, What do you, I mean, I, I'll be honest, even talking to you now, dude, I didn't even, 
when I went to set up this interview, I talked to Mandy at Bass and I'm like, do, do I call him directly or do I have to go through his parents? Um, how did, tell me about your tournament experience previous to this. Have you fished tournaments for a long time or is this relatively new for you? Yeah. So, um, so I started fishing, um, when I started, uh, bass fishing, I started really just straight into the tournaments when I was about 11, 12 years old. Um, my dad, he kind of introduced me to uh, the whole tournament thing. He just fished a little local club here around Florida and his partner that he used to fish with, he had a son, um, a little bit older than me who was, uh, they, they just wanted to team up as a, as a team. And he, he just asked me one day, I remember if we were sitting down at a dinner table and he was like, Hey Aaron, like you'd be interested in, um, doing like this bass fishing thing that, uh, you know, I always go do around Florida. And I was like, yeah, we can try it out at that time. Um, I did, you know, little league baseball and just didn't really know anything about it really. So he, uh, he took me out there and, you know, we had a great time and that's just how it started. Really. I started, um, fishing some high school tournaments after that, when I got in high school and that really like kicked off, you know, those were kind of the bigger tournaments that I'd ever entered, um, around, you know, a hundred plus boats would usually get, but, um, you know, just fished the high school program, went through that. I'm, I'm a senior now, still fishing the high school program, Florida, Florida Bass Nation High School. And just recently, just fished my first year of the BFLs, kind of got a feel for that. And, you know, we did pretty decent and, um, you know, just, just went through this team federation thing and made it, made it to the championship and qualified for the classic, you know, something that never really expected or, you know, but always dreamed of. And it's just crazy that it really happened. Did like the next morning when you woke up, I mean, when I was 17 years old, I used to dream of all sorts of stuff. I mean, part of my problem in life is I, I dream so vividly. I actually start to believe them, but I would imagine that there had to be a part of you that like literally woke up the next day and was like, wait a second. Did that, I mean, you, you showed up at that tournament, a 17 year old high school kid, you know, and you're leaving that tournament, the youngest to qualify in history. Has there been times this past week where like, you're just doing regular things and you're like, did that really happen? Yeah, um, that that's definitely uh come to my mind a couple times. You know, just you know, right after that tournament when I qualified, I actually had another tournament, a high school tournament. So we went down the Okeechobee like right after uh right after weigh in, and you know we fished that seal and had had a lot of confidence honestly, and um, we didn't do too great. It was honestly a reality check, <laughs> ten pounds, and um it was it was after once I got home that everything kind of settled and, you know, some, some thoughts set in things like that. So a lot of people your age are probably this time of year, pretty, pretty excited about Christmas. I mean, Christmas is a big deal. Did your Christmas just come early? Yeah, honestly, um, I was, uh, not really, not really sure if I'm even be here for Christmas or, or, uh, anything like that, trying to plan, plan a trip to, uh, to Grand Lake before the cutoff. Hopefully the uh, the weather is a uh, you know decent for us, but um, I'm just so busy with trying to grind out all the tournaments and just get better at fishing every day. It's uh, it's hard to spend a lot of time with my family, even though I'm 17 still. So so you are going to Grand to pre fish before the cutoff. Yeah, if the weather uh, you know holds up. So tell me about you as an angler. I mean, what, what if you had to classify your yourself mm -hmm. as what elite series pro would you say I fish similar to this person? Hmm. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm a big, you know, live scope kind of guy, even though I live from Florida, I just love fishing offshore. Um, but I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe, maybe Koya Fujita, just because, you know, I like live scoping. Not really big with all the stuff that he throws and things like that. But, I mean, just an offshore person in general, I guess. Talk to me about live scoping because I'm sure you know. I mean, before we went live, you, you told me you watch all these podcasts and you see the the disagreements and things that are going on in the world with, with forward-facing sonar, with live scope. 
What do you think that is doing to the youth? Because a lot of people will point fingers at it, you know, pe older people, that, and they'll say, hey, younger people have an advantage, this and that. But amongst your peers, amongst the people from the Florida Bass Nation that you keep hearing from, people your age, what are the thoughts about, about forward-facing sonar? Um, you know, most of the you know, the kids I um, hang around with and a couple of live scopers themselves, um, you know, they really like it. They just, we all think it's a tool that's here to stay. And, you know, it helps us learn about the activity of the fish and how they, uh, how they kind of go through their yearly transition. And, you know, on, it opens up like a whole new, um, you know, like dimension almost of like this fishing thing. Um, but I think, I mean, it's just a tool, honestly, hopefully here to stay, but there's a lot of, a lot of controversy about it right now. Um, but I love, I love using it. I'm just going to keep using it. Do you ever hear that kind of controversy amongst people in your age bracket? Like, is there high school competitors that are like, yeah, I don't like using it or are they all kind of, they're all in. Yeah. Um, most, most of them now they, they they're all uh, getting used to it. They kind of like it, you know. I mean, I'm sure a lot of these kids play video games and it's kind of, you know, their thing, but being from Florida, you still have some people that just, you know, fish without it and you know. It's it's worked out pretty good for you. I mean, um uh, you know, obviously Lots of people got a giggle out of your your Instagram handle, the Scope Goat. Well, I mean, it, you you've kind of put it out there. I mean, you clearly are because you're the youngest ever to qualify for the classic. Do you does this make you? Um, you're just about to finish high school. Does this make you one of the most sought after collegiate recruits, or is that even the direction you've chosen to go? Um, I've had a couple um, people kind of reach out to me, but. Um, I, I just I don't think I'm gonna go down that path. Um, I'm pretty sure gonna hop in the opens in 2025 once I finish finish this high school season off. I'm just gonna really use this next year as you know getting better, trying to just work on everything that I need to need to work on and just become a better angler all around. When did I mean did did this accomplishment change any of that or did you? Was that your plan all along? I'm going to get done with high school and I'm going to become a pro angler. Yeah, it's it's definitely opened up a couple more doors, I guess. Um, before before it happened, I was on edge with the college thing and going the other route. Um, but I think I think after after we qualified, it kind of put me more in the direction of just not going to college. So you're all in. You're a pro angler now. We're gonna try. <laughs> How do your parents feel about that? Um, they they support it. They think it's it's good. Um, either of my parents they didn't go to college either. My dad owns a own a owns a painting company, and he supports me through my journey. He's the one that's always been there for me. You know, helping me pay entry fees and things like that. But you know, it's just what parents are there for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he kind of extra supported you because you guys won the team championship together and then he became the world's biggest soccer dad, except it was pro fishing. He literally watched you. He was in the tournament, but watched you compete is what I heard. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Those final two days, he was, you know, maybe a cast or two lengths away from me. <laughs> he, he watched it all go down. So is that like for the rest of your life, you're going to be like, well, remember, you became the youngest because I didn't cast. Like, is he going to hold that over you for the rest of your life? I don't think so. He Before the tournament even started, I mean, we were already kind of talking about that. Like, if we make that final day, like, you know, what are we going to do? And, um, you know, he just – he really wants to see me succeed. And I just – I can't thank my dad enough, honestly. Do you have any concerns going into the Classic? Like, I mean, I feel like it would be normal. Like – that in your head you're like, oh, I hope I don't screw this up or something. Any of those kind of thoughts going through your head, or is it all just positive? Yeah, just trying to stay positive. But um, there's a couple thoughts roaming around about, man, we can't suck it up. But <laughs> just going to go there and soak it all in and just try and do our best.
How, how do you do on public speaking? How do you feel about going on the classic stage? Um, man, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one for me. I'm not, I'm not the best speaker or, you know, good, uh, talking to a big audience, but we're trying to work on it. Definitely, uh, got to improve on our social skills a little bit, but it's going to be really nerve wracking. I think. <laughs> Well, I mean, most 17 year olds aren't great at communicating with adults, never mind a, you know, an arena full of, of said adults. Have you figured out what song you're weighing into yet? Um, no, I haven't even figured that out. But All right. Well, maybe we can get some comments from our viewers and they'll, they'll, they'll give you a direction maybe, or I'm sure a lot of great choices you have ahead of you, but uh, it's incredible to me. It's one of the most exciting things. It's a record. It, to to do this at 17 i mean i would have bet a lot that it would never happen and and if it were to happen i always would have thought okay well we'll we'll get a collegiate angler in that's competing against people his age but i mean you went and whooped a bunch of growing men and adults in this event um is this just are you the next kvd and we just haven't figured it out yet or what man i don't know I don't really know. I, I hope so. I mean, but we all got to find out here soon. But hopefully uh, it's looking good, I think. How much experience do you have fishing outside of Florida? Not much. Um, Just going through the high school program, we qualified for the national championship uh, the first three years I fished. Um, So we went to Tennessee, faced f the fish Lake Chickamauga. Yeah. And then um, went to Hartwell the past two years, have some experience there, and recently been to uh, Alabama to fish like you follow. But, you know, not much other than that, honestly, just a couple tournaments. And um, but we're going to we're going to try and get out of state a little bit more and just work on uh, working on improving. So when you say you're 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 going to go the open route and, and not do the collegiate route, have you put a plan together? on how you're going to learn the other aspects of the sport, because that, that is one of the advantages of college fishing. You look at a team like Bethel, they take anglers from Florida and put them with anglers from the North or anglers from the West coast. And that's what makes those anglers as versatile and as successful as they are. But you're obviously going to have to do it kind of solo. How are you going to do that? Um, You know, just, we got kind of almost a full year here just to really get everything, you know, tweaked up and try and learn new techniques. But I'm really going to try and travel a lot. Um, you know, Monday is actually my last day of school. I do an early graduate thing. Um, so the rest of this year, starting after January, uh, we're free from school. We just got to go, you know, walk and graduate in May. Hopefully I'm there for that. <laughs> but um you know, just going to travel around a lot, travel to new places, try and look at the tournament schedule, see where they've been, see, uh, you know, just do a lot of research, honestly, and just uh, just try and try and learn, learn a thing or two here and there. All right. I, I want to learn about you outside of fishing. I mean, that lots has been written about how you caught them and that sort of thing. But when you're not fishing, what what do you do? What What is a a good time for Aaron Yavorsky? Um. Usually just going and hanging out with friends, um, you know, just kind of more, I'm more introverted, I guess. Um, don't really have, you know, too, too many friends. It's just, um, trying to grind out this fishing thing really is. I just spent a lot of time fishing, you know, never, uh, never really went to any of those homecomings or proms in high school, just always been fishing and waking up early, going going to bed early, things like that. And, you know, it's just been, I guess I could kind of say, I mean, a little boring maybe, but, you know, it's just more of like trying to get, get, get to that success and, you know, grind it out. When did you, I, I know you told me when you started fishing tournaments, but, but you seem pretty locked into like, Hey, this is my life. This is my focus, which is, remarkable i mean literally every other sport there is you know whether it doesn't matter whether you're listening to somebody talk about lebron james in the past whoever patrick mahomes i mean they all made huge sacrifices missed things like you're talking about proms and homecomings and things like that because they were that committed to making it in their sport 
when did this drive start for you? Like, because it, you know, to, to most people, it seems, you know, unrealistic for a kid at 17 years old to be that locked in. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was just going through the high school program helped me, uh, you know, learn a lot because we really traveled around a lot more than I, I had used to just fishing that little, little club, club tournament thing. But that, uh, that opened up a lot of doors. And then really this year, jumping in those BFLs, the second one of the year, it was on Harris chain. Actually, I ended up placing third and, you know, that gave me like a lot of confidence after that. It was in March and ever since March this year, it's just been kind of like, you know, like grind, 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 you know, just put your head down and focus on this and, you know, you can do this kind of thing. But well, clearly, clearly you, you can do, you, does it concern you or do you even think about these kind of things at your age? You know, you hear people say things like you got to pay your dues. You, you got to put in your time. I mean, I don't know that you can say at 17 years old that, whatever that means, paying your dues, you haven't spent a lot of time. Does it concern you that this is happening too quick in some ways? Um, Maybe just a bit, but I mean, you know, there's no real pressure on me, I guess, which helps a little bit. I don't have to pay, you know, any bills or anything like that. So really stress-free. So just going to try and just go out there and have fun. Yeah. Living at home and loving life. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it um, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch this unfold. Um, and I know you say you've missed some proms and homecomings and things like that. Well, the world's biggest homecoming or prom is the Bassmaster Classic. And uh, I, I can't wait to have you on stage, dude. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, and the amazing thing is I think you're going to inspire so many more people. And and when people point fingers at like the sport is getting younger, but every sport's getting younger. It, it is amazing. Why do you think that is? Do you have any idea why this outside of forward facing sonar? Obviously, that's the the easy thing to go to. But why do you think professional fishing is getting younger? Yeah, um, I think really, you know, just with now nowadays and age, there's so much you know technology and just there's so many more like available resources there's just kids nowadays you know just taking all that in and learning so fast it's crazy you know with how much internet and uh you know information that's that's online you can just go on there and really just learn whatever you want you know obviously from a trusted source on whatever you need and it's just super easy to get information and you know, just, just all that kind of stuff what what is your biggest weakness as an angler? What do you really need to learn? Um, probably need to learn a little bit more how uh how the fish kind of spawn. I guess being from Florida, um, it feels like every time we fish the tournament here in Florida around the spawn, it's always been like a miss of like you know just like that wave pushing up and. I'm going to try this year to get out there and just try and learn the spawn kind of deal. And it seems these tours are kind of, you know, just chasing that spawn, I feel like almost. But I don't really know. I need to work on shallow fishing a little bit and, you know, just a little bit of everything. Do you realize how weird that sounds to people that the two things that you said you need to work on is is spawn and shallow, which is if if you say to anybody like somebody lives in Florida, what are they really good at? It's probably those two things. Right. Yeah, it's definitely weird. I'm usually the one leaving the frogs and you know flipping jigs at home and just taking the crankbaits and things like that. So it's uh it's kind of weird, but um you know in Florida, not many people do it. So I think that's uh on well, that now a lot of people are starting to get out there, but. You know, it's, it's definitely helped just with less pressure. Can you quickly take me through your process of learning things? Because I think that a, a lot, what your point about the good, about the increase in technology, increase in information. So let's just say this afternoon, me and you are going to go fishing and, and we're going to fish bedding fish. How do you go? What is your process like? What and I'm and I want you to tell me not just specifically going fishing, but the process 
probably starts at a laptop, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, looking at the lake, especially if we're going to go out there and just kind of, you know, fish for spawning fish, just look at uh, what areas of the lake might be the best, those high percentage areas and, you know, do, do a bunch of research on the lake and everything. And then once you, once you get out there, just go get a feel for it. If, uh, if what you, what you had planned wasn't really working and try and do like maybe the whole opposite, but, um, Really, yeah, just starting at, at the laptop and then getting out there and getting a feel for it. I mean, once you get out there and uh, and you get, you know, one, one, a clue or a hint, just take that and run with it, honestly. Just trying to figure something out. After you won this event, obviously, your dad was there. A beautiful moment, I'm sure. Well, who were you most excited to tell, like, outside of your family? Who was the person that you were most excited to, I can't wait to tell who? Um, hmm, that's a tough one. I'm really not sure because you know my mom. My mom came to the weigh-in, and my dad was there, and those are really the two that you know really there for me. But probably, um, really my uh my uh, high school, my old high school partner, um, Jet Stanley. He uh he just recently went into the Coast Guard. He's now stationed up in Georgia. So, um. He actually, he actually drove down the first day when I had 30 pounds from Georgia all the way to the weigh-in and watched me weigh in, but um, probably, probably him. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Aaron, I'm excited to see you at the Bassmaster Classic. Don't worry about the stage. We'll, we'll have fun. Uh, it, it'll, it's, I'll try and make it as simple and as easy as possible. And I think the thing that you're going to find is, you know, you said, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of friends. You, when you get to the classic, you're going to have a whole bunch of friends and you're going to inspire um, legions uh, of anglers uh, moving forward because uh, you have set a record that, quite frankly, may never, ever get broken. But uh, you know how that deal is. Somebody's always trying to break it. But oh, yeah. uh, congratulations. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me on here today. No problem. No problem. I, I will. I will see you very, very soon. The youngest Bassmaster Classic qualifier in history. And he just hung up. So that's all he had to say. Tommy Sanders, we have loyal viewers that tune in here week after week. There's at least a dozen of them, and I'm thankful for all of them. And I thought, what is better to do right before Christmas than have Tommy Sanders on? I mean, your voice. I know I tell you this, and I know you deny it, but your voice takes people to a very, very special place. Well, does it really? Well, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a familiar place. For, since I've been doing this for 40 years, I'm sure a lot of people are tired of it, you know, that I just, you know, I keep talking for some reason because I can't really do anything else. Well, I mean, I, I hear you there. Trust me. <laughs> but I believe you can do other things. Speaking of which, you've grown a phenomenal mustache. This is new, right? Yeah, my friend, one of my associates just referred to it as a trash stash. So I'm kind of crestfallen and disappointed. It is, I don't even know what a trash stash is, but it sounds terrible. So uh, uh, what it is, it's it's the result of cutting yourself two times in the last three weeks shaving. And you take your razor and you just, you know, get out of here later for you. Well, you know, tr so. trust but me. Now I look like the Monopoly man. So everything's, you know, <laughs> if I had the little top hat, you know, and the waistcoat, I can go to town <laughs> Mr. Pennyworth, that's his name. Is that his name? That is his wow. actual name, Mr. Pennyworth, I believe. Do they have the same? Do they have the same properties in Monopoly in Canada as they have in the United States, or is it? Is it all always the same park place and you know whatever? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's a special ca Canadian Monopoly and stuff like that, but uh, yeah, Port we still Credit, go to park place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Street, Queen Street, yeah, all that stuff. Very yeah. good, Young Street, yeah. Queen Street. I mean, just look yeah. at how educated Tommy. You are very educated. You know little bits about everything. I honestly believe that. Is that true? Useless information. I got it. I got it for you. Got... <laughs> well, nothing useless you've ever given me, and there's nothing trashy about that stash. But uh, <laughs> thank you. I feel better now. Whoever go, said bro. that, I will tell me about it afterwards, and I will okay. open hand slap that person. All right. <laughs> All in. Tommy, you have been around for a long time and you have done some incredibly fabled Bassmaster moments. I mean, so much 
incredible stuff. And I know how you got the job. I mean, you were a voiceover guy and somehow they called you. But did, what was that first? I mean, you had an office just down the road from JM, correct? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah, just just right around the corner from JM, like like 200 feet from where they were. And But I was familiar with, with Jerry because at that time there, there were a couple of fishing uh, TV shows produced in this area and and in and, and, and cohorts with some people from Memphis and everything like that. And, and uh, a fellow named Mark Delindy, who was at a, a TV studio in town, had gone to work for Jerry and I had worked with him, you know, a lot of freelance stuff through the years. And I, and I got to looking at Jerry's show and they all of a sudden it started looking like, you know, the movies because they were shooting it on film and doing this newfangled transfer process where it looked like a feature film. And I thought, man, you know, and I'd watched Jerry for years, you know, you know coming in on, in the TV studio for, for eight minutes, you know, after the after the sports way back in the day. And this was something else. But anyway, uh, the folks at Jerry's office called me to come and do a do a voiceover for a couple of things. And one thing led to another. And he wrangled me in a, a, an audition and I got to be the guy on ESPN Outdoors. Do you remember what that first edition was like, what what the read was? Oh no! Well, it was it was just to talk about some outdoor subject, oh, some okay. conservation subject for a little bit on camera, kind of do it off the cuff if you can, and then throw to a specific show, whether it was Jimmy Houston or Hank Parker or uh, you know wh whatever it was, Suzuki's Great Outdoors or Larry Zonka or all those shows from back in the day. Yeah. So this this job that you have done so well at this this wasn't wasn't your childhood dream, I take it, like. It, when you were a kid, what did what did Tommy Sanders as a child, a 13 year old Tommy Sanders, what did you envision yourself being? I, I wanted I re actually wanted to be on TV. I wanted to be, you know, not on TV. I, I wanted to like produce television, you know, make programs, you know, and and and, and live in a studio <laughs> you know, where we did shows all day. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mission accomplished. But uh, yeah, I, I actually I actually did entertain, you know, unrealistic fantasies like that back in the day. It well, not unrealistic, and you do live in a studio now. Um I'm here. I'm here one right of now. the things that is amazing that people don't know about you, I think, is just I mean, I talked to Mike McKinnis about it this morning, our our mutual boss at JM. Yeah. Yeah. And and I asked him about you, and he was like, one of the things that still amazed me to this day is how much Tommy has done, you know, and if you look back at that time when you were doing raps and you were doing weekly 52 weeks a year, you were doing stuff for ESPN. You were oh, also yeah. doing the Bassmaster elite series. You were also doing the Bassmaster majors. You were also doing the Redfish cup. Yeah. When you look back at sporting how, dog challenge, all, all of it. Yeah. 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 How crazy was that time in your life? Well, at that, at one point uh, we were doing not only, ESPN Outdoors on every Saturday for 52 weeks. We were, we were doing it on Saturday and Sunday. It would be on the newly christened ESPN2 on Sunday. And for one, about a year and a half, it was on every day. There was a, a, a daily edition, which was an hour, an hour and a half on ESPN2. So 365 days a year we were doing that. And, and uh, uh, close to that same time, there was a point when we were doing a, not, not nine, but 14 uh, Bassmaster uh, programs, you know, including uh, um you know, the regular top 150 or, or what the tour, the Bassmaster yeah. tour at that time, plus, uh, plus elite fifties and, and, and things like that. College and uh, college bass fishing as well came along in the mid to 2000. So, uh, uh, about six dog, sh dog shows a year and about seven steel timber sports shows a year and about eight redfish cup shows a year. It was, there was, wasn't a lot of spare time to just kind of kick it around. I could say do you look at back in those times as the good old days or is that like hell? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of it. It was, you know, I've never thought of my job as it's, 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 it's been stressful at times, but it's never been a drudge. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I couldn't complain. It's like the greatest job on earth. You know, no one, no one would take me seriously if I complained about it. So I won't. What is your favorite part about your job? Like if, if you had to pick a moment, I'm sure it's a lot of things, but if you had to pick one moment, one thing that you just love about your job, what is that? You know, what I love about my job is what we started doing, you and me and and uh, Zona and Davey and Such and Ronnie, 10 years, 10 years ago, 
we started doing live bass fishing on the air. That, that was a dream all along. We, we were doing, and we, we talked about this a little bit before we came on here. We, we were doing a real good job on, you know, taking each tournament, condensing it down to an hour or the classic, condensing it, condensing it down to three hours, rolling that out as a very polished, what they call anecdotal in the TV business, meaning it's something that happened before, not live, show for people to enjoy. But then we made that jump to live bass fishing and oh thanks that's pretty pro right there thank you my phone just went off uh, just fine right See, okay you could have grabbed it i mean it would have added yeah, yeah that would have not added to the program at all <laughs> uh, but but yeah that 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 point at which we started started doing that i felt like i was part of, of of really not something that had been going on for years and years but something that was brand new and something that we're all getting to invent our little part of it as it went along and uh, that 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 to me was was a big thrill must have been incredibly frightening at the same time. I mean, because you, you are, you're, I mean, as you've many people have worked with, you've said, it, I mean, but you're the glue, like you're the reason that keeps the wheels on when things go bad, you can ask people questions and they can answer them, but you're still yielding the, I mean, if somebody stops talking, everybody looks at you, Tommy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's true uh, you know it's 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 an old it's an old trick i guess that tv people have been doing for for 75 years is being able to disengage your brain and just keep talking you know just sort of, sort of just sort of keep refeeding the same information in a different form over and over again till actually we have something to show somebody that's uh that's, that's do you that's, get panicked at all ever like do oh you yeah oh absolutely stressed out panicked especially really we, yeah even even today before we start a live a live broadcast i i get i get a case of the butterflies i'm you know i'm it's because it's the fear of the unknown you know it's like what what is really going to happen when am i going to actually you know make a horrible stumble that causes untold misery to to, to a lot of people uh, hopefully that hasn't happened yet, but that's something I sure think about. Do you, do you get butterflies when you, you, you certainly don't seem to. I, I don't feel, I feel an excitement. I feel like there's an engage, like it's, it's almost like a heightened, it's weird. Like I, I don't get butterflies like the traditional sense. Like, and I don't think I really ever have, like in the, I don't think my mind is smart enough to figure out how stupid you are to go out in a state. You know what I mean? Like it, it but I, I get an excitement and an intent, you know what I mean? That is like, to me that I love, I love it. I love, um, yeah. and, and it's different for me more on the stage than it is for at an event, like it, doing play by play and stuff like that. To me, I mean, there's an excitement with that, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think it's traditional excitement. It, it, it's not nerve. Like I'm like, Oh, what's going to go wrong. But there is an excitement like, Hey, you need to lock in dummy because they're going to figure out that you shouldn't have this job. If you screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how I feel. But I think about you and I think especially the classic when you've got, you know, 10,000 people out there in the audience, all wanting everything to happen all at once. And you've got boats coming back from the lake and you've got unknown gaps in your content you know, on the road ahead of you, you know, the, right around the corner that you can't see. And that's when I, I feel, man, I, I, I feel anxiety for you. Yeah. I mean, you don't think big picture. You just get, <laughs> if you, if you, I mean, if you really start to think, Hey, the boats are stuck in traffic and I'll hear that in my ear at times. Hey, you're going to, I mean, it's almost the worst thing to tell me because you know, you don't want to even be thinking about it, but I just, I mean, I just think like you we're we're lucky to have a job where, we we're doing something we love. I don't know that I could like, if you said, Hey, darts. Well, actually that's a bad example. Cause I would love to be part of darts at some point in my life. I do want to yell 140. But, <laughs> but, that's uh, pretty good. Or but, bowls or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, another sport that I'm not into, I think that I would have a harder time doing that. You know what I mean? I love, Oh yeah. Bass fishing. Like it amazes me people. And you're very much like that. People like Robbie Floyd is like that. Like Robbie Floyd has literally spoken and, and been a commentator on everything from eating competitions to the Bassmaster <laughs> classic, to the Olympics, to indie racing and everything in between. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. He, he, he can, he does his homework and he's, he's exciting and you know, he's, he's got what, what an aptitude he has for that stuff. He delivers. 
What's the worst mistake you ever think you made? Like over the years, did you have one where you were like, I can't believe I just did that? Oh, you know, the first time we worked on the classic, I think was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty bad. It was like 2001 in New Orleans and, uh, you know, working with a bunch of people that I didn't know very well and everything. And first time I'd, I'd ever been live, somebody given me the traffic, you know, where we're going because, because the classic, just like you say, with the, all, all the pieces don't fall in as planned. And then, you know, time is, is, has to be, you know, uh, lengthened and, and shortened and everything like that. And I actually threw to a commercial because I thought I heard them tell me in my, in my ear to throw to a commercial before, right before something important was supposed to, to, to happen on the stage. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I pretty much saw the, the whole, you know, walls of, of, uh, the city you know, caving in on me at that point right there. But somehow, somehow time, time wounds all heals. I mean, heals all wounds as they say. <laughs> yeah, no, that is a, that's a, I mean, my first classic, I remember almost knocking over the trophy. And that to me stands out as like, like the trophy literally went doo, 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 on the stand. Cause I'm walking backwards or whatever. And I hit it with my elbow. And I remember just looking and seeing it go, dunk, dunk. <laughs> you know, it probably hard to even move, but in my mind, this thing oh, yeah. was teeter tottering back and forth. Um, and you just hope people don't see, but in today's world of social media, they remind you immediately as soon as you're oh, done, yeah. you and, screwed and, up. And actually, that sort of adds to your legend. I mean, that's a physical gag that you can have fun with and everything <laughs> like that. The people can have fun with it. It's not just something, you know, awful and nervous making like what I was doing there. You, um, I've told you for years, and, and many people have told you this, and I know you're going to, again, be like, no. I, I honestly believe that you're one of the greatest commentators. I mean, you and... Zona specifically, I mean, you and Dave here are great. You and I mean, and it's no slight to anybody, but I just feel like you and Zona have an incredible long run together, incredible chemistry. I, I would love to see you guys do everything, whether, whether it be Monday night football, the Olympics. I would, I mean, if there was an additional bought in fee, I would pay for it to see you guys. But who do you think in all other sports is good at, is good at your job? Like, who do you look at and be like, Oh, in wow. all sports, you say. Yeah. In all sports. Yeah. You know, in well, football season right now, and of course, you know, uh, NFL action is going on right now. To me, the play-by-play -play guy is, is Tony Romo, uh, just barely ahead of Chris Collingsworth. Uh, Romo is so quick and so fast. He's real quarterback-centric in his analysis, and Collinsworth is good defense and, and wide receiver-centric in his, and they both have, you know, great excitement and great in-the-moment, you know, ability. Uh, in the booth right there. Troy Aikman, good too, good also quarterback centric, but I, 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 that's the way I, I rank him in that. Uh, for baseball, the guy I like right now is Ron Darling. I don't know if you ever listened to Ron. He's yeah. on TBS sometimes, former Met, you know, pitcher, and uh, he, he's, he's really just well spoken, really intelligent and, 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 and yet bright and funny, you know, when he, when he needs to be. And, and uh, let's see, college football. Oh gosh, you know, all my college football heroes of, of <laughs> Keith Jackson's and Ron Franklin, our friend, you know, and and, and those guys so are not there anymore. But uh, Todd Black Blackledge is pretty good, I think, and uh, um, oh, the guy who did it with Musburger for so many years, and he does he does the oh god, um, well, Herb I think Street? I, is it Kurt Herb Street? Herb Street. Yeah. yeah, I like him much more in college than than in NFL. What do you think? I, I'm a big fan of his, honestly. I yeah. I, I find him. I think he has such a unique quality and I think you have that same quality by owning the room without trying to own the room. And, and uh, what I mean, okay. like it's to me, it's easy for a Romo to stand out. It's easy for an Aikman to stand out because they come, it's Troy Aikman. You know what I mean? He comes with that and that information. But I think the like what I love about Herb Street is I find he stands out, but you, so it's not like you're like, oh, that's Herb Street. Like to, to me, like I feel like there's just, and I don't even know how to explain. It. It's the same with you. I know what you mean. Like when yeah. I'm watching you, I'm like, oh, I, I want to. I'm. You draw me into things, but you're not drawing me in by waving your arms and being like, hey, look at me. You're you're <laughs> painting a picture. Um, and I think Herb Street's very good at that. Why don't? Yeah. You, why do you like him better in college than NFL? I, I just doesn't, you know, and, and Al Michaels, thank you know, poor guy that just dropped him from the, 
from yeah. the playoffs now that's terrible you know he's 10 years older he, i mean there's only one of him in the world you know he's 10 years older than i not that i'm ever in his league but my goodness you know but he is so great and he was so great with collingsworth but it it, it just i don't know why it, it doesn't seem quite as quite as meshed together to me and i, I probably just listen at the wrong times or, or something like that what do you think do you, do you like him on the nfl stuff yeah i, I mean there might if you're comparing the two I think I'm too big a fan of his to, to like, I just think he's that good. You know what I mean? Not like oh, I really, yeah, yeah. um, and, and I think commentators is such a personal thing. Like, I think we're all going to get replaced eventually with AI, you know, oh, somebody will be like, I'd like to listen to Bassmasters with an Australian female commentator. <laughs> oh, it, it will, it will be, it's probably going to be delivered within the year. You know, <laughs> if I can, I can tell you, well, who do you like? Who do you like in, in pro football? Who's your favorite pro football? Answer? Um, see i'm i'm all over the place but i think al michaels as far as like a straight commentator al michaels there's no better to me like really? a, to me he's so good um i think as far as a um color guy the and he's the newest most popular thing in all of sports and i've been a fan of his for a number of years is pat mcafee and and i think his story is incredible because you know he was a kicker that became a stand-up comic and whatever and, and tried to get on Monday night football and all these things. And they said, no way you are a risk. You are a bizarro, a lot like a guy we work with Mark Zona, <laughs> not that he was turned away, but you know what I mean? Like he brings that excitement with him. And um, so I think McAfee is incredible in all of that. But I also think that there's great sports voices like a Dan Patrick, I think a Dan sure. Patrick, oh, yeah, yeah, really, really good. Um, Absolutely, and he's 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 at his best now. What he's been doing for the past fifteen years, you know the the pot the the, the show like you're doing, right? Now. Yeah, you know, he's, he's man. Really well, not, it's not quite like what I'm doing, Tommy. I mean, <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> well, who's the greatest hockey announcer? Who who, who are the legend? Give, give me two legends who are still on top of their game. In um, I am. Well, I get the greatest hockey announcer in my opinion is, um, but that's because I'm, uh, I'm from Canada. I'm from Toronto, but, uh, Joe Bowen who is, is retired, but he is, he is, I mean, some people would hate him because he's a Homer, you know what I mean? But he, he, mm -hmm. that's what I love about him. Like now every announcer is a Homer, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter where you listen to the chiefs guys, oh. a Homer, they're all, but at one time that was frowned upon and, he did a really good job of, of figuring out a way to to do it and 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 make you cheer for him at the same time. But um, yeah, no, I, I'd say he's probably about the best. I mean, there's Foster Hewitt and all these you know legendary names that have been around. The other guy in Canada that is incredible, that's a groundbreaker, but he lost his job, um, lost his job like a few months before COVID, and literally all of Canada's been like from the moment you you fired don cherry it is oh. never the world has never been the same but he is like a canadian you know um i don't know what, he he's he, yeah he's the, he's the you know he's the john madden of of oh oh well, even hockey horrible. you know yeah. what i mean like he's yeah. you know what i mean he's a personality and everything but yeah i'd, I'd guess him um but nobody tunes in this list of uh, we get I get in trouble every time I talk about other sports. So let's get back to fishing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Why do you think you've been successful in your job? Oh gosh, I I don't know. I I really I, I scratch my head. I've been very lucky to have gotten certain opportunities, and and you know recognize them for as things that I need to you know prepare for pretty stringently and get ready to go and deliver something. I always try to have something ready to go. I always try to have something, you know, that a narrative, a story, a, a storyline is as far-fetched as it may be, it's as, as sparse as it may be that I can fill in when I, when I open my yapper and start going, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of what's helped me. I think I'm, I uh, maybe should be in the moment more, but I'll also, I scheme a little bit. I plan a little bit. Yeah. So how early, like, when would you start that, that planning, you know, like, Hey, we got a live show starting tomorrow at noon. Do you think about the day before? Is it hours before? Yeah, Is it minutes I do. Before? I, I, I really do. I, I think about that, you know, and uh, I, I know this sounds, 
I inherited this from my father. I go out and, and walk a round of golf by myself the night before we we do this. And, and I do what the late Ron Franklin, who used to work on, on the Bassmaster Classic, told me one day, he says, well, I was out in the parking lot, uh, you, you know, doing walking and doing working on my ad libs. I was working on my ad libs. And I thought, what's he mean by his ad libs? And, and I, I, I figured it out. It's just everything he says off the cup, you know, it's not off the cup. He thinks about those things. He writes them in a way of speaking. You know, and so that's that's kind of the what, what I do. You know, I sort of just don't think about anything like that. No pressure, no no time constraint. Just everything that occurs to me that might be worth mentioning in the course of a day. You know, a seven hour day being on the air and, and talking. So, do you once you think of it, do you write it down, or is it just something you kind of rehearse in your head? Yeah. What's your yeah. process? I try to remember it. You know, I, I think of it, and of course. 11% of it I'll remember and sometimes that's enough and oftentimes it's not enough yeah you've been through a lot with bass when you look at how how many you know different ownerships different directions you know you know from being a edited show to now everything's live all the time and, and increasingly more you've seen some crazy ideas and I don't need you to put a name to any of these but tommy would you share with me some of the craziest ideas that were ever pitched at you by non-fishing producers to do at the bass masters <laughs> well uh the, the first uh the first stabs at covering the classic uh giving coverage to the classic uh live coverage to the classic one of the craziest ideas was let's have you on a set uh with an with the with the play-by-play -play person and the occasional guest and we won't show any fishing but you guys will talk about the classic for three or four hours, which is what happened. Uh, you know, we'll try to get some tapes in. We'll try to, we'll try, but it really never worked out very much. We'd get an occasional fish catch without context, you know, that they'd say, okay, now we're going to, okay, get ready. We're going to roll this, this, this catch that just came in from Lake Wiley. And, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, you guys talk about it and everything like that or from, or from the Monongahela river, you know, we think, is where this catch was and that's like once every two hours you'd get something like that and the rest of the time you're just you're just tap dancing and and you know and you're with some very really good people to talk to which who carry the show you know guys like mark menendez ben roethlisberger spent an hour with us on classic coverage one time and he was terrific he, he was great you know and he fished as a kid and he just loved to rhapsodize about the the joy of fishing and, and and things like that and talked a lot about the nfl and stuff but it was it had very little to do with the class you know that 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 was that was one of the as far as individual silly things i you know i don't know sometimes there was there was some pressure on us to to hype up you know conflict where it's, where it's just re regular ordinary dis differences of opinion you know yeah. sort of sort of turn that into a, a you know, a, a life or death, you know, someone struggling just to survive this day, you know, <laughs> you know, just over dramatization, which is, you know, that's a TV producer's job. And, and if they, they know the sport or they don't know the sport, you know, sometimes they come in with the ultimatum that, you know, we got to do stuff where people can't switch away. Yeah. You know? Where they where they stay with it, you know. Hey, what's going to happen to this guy? What is he's in danger, and uh, since he could he could be very could be very bad. I better I better stay with. You, know? you understand that, you know. You you know why they do that, but still, it's it's uncomfortable making. I but see, I don't I don't feel like we ever get any of that now, or maybe they no. just don't tell me. But like to me, it's just like, hey, talk about stuff, and then like. Yeah. I mean, I guess if we talk about the wrong stuff, we'll get in trouble at some point. But I mean, I've talked about a lot of wrong stuff and haven't really got in trouble. We've, like <laughs> we've all of us talked about the wrong stuff so many times, we have a pretty good idea what to, what to steer clear of, and, and and how to go ahead and talk about it without without raising anyone one's attention in a bad way, you know. So, is there when you look back at at all the different ownerships and stuff like that, um. Is there, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say is there a bet. What is the what are the what is the golden era of Bassmaster to you? It seems like it's something different to everybody. Is it now? Is it the past? Is it the future? Oh, I think it's now. I, I mean, I I think it's now after the first three or four years of doing live, 
till now, I think is the golden age of, of really being able to tell the story of what yeah. happens at the bass fishing tournament. I think, you know, before that, the camera, warp camera, you know, situation and, 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 uh, connection situation was, was often so, it, you know, really not reliable that it interfered with the ability to tell the story and to, and to know certain essential parts. We'd lose guys, multiple guys for an entire day. And, um, you know, and they would come back and having done great things. But uh, now I think it's just, it's, it's so well controlled. We have so many, you know, great people commenting on, I think the anglers know how to play it better. Uh, yeah. than they did in the day. Absolutely. They, 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 they know when to talk, they know what to explain to the viewer and how to say what just happened in a way that everyone can understand. I, I think now is the, is the golden age right now. Do you everyone remember the my age would disagree and say the golden age was 1985. Do you think <laughs> that's natural though? Thing. Like as people age, they oh, do. Sure. I mean, yeah. You know, like you get to a certain age and you're like, I know what kind of music I like. I'm not wanting to listen to other ones. I, yeah, I, I don't care how well you well you do it. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know, yeah, exactly. That's right. That's that's the principle at hand here. Do you remember when you first met Mark Zona? Yeah, I do. I do. We were. Um, I can't remember. We were doing a preview of uh, of, of some like a couple of tournaments. And they had us up to ESPN. Uh, the, the, Mark Zone had already been co contacted and everything like that. And uh, and, and he was going to be hired. He was going to come on. And, and they wanted him and Jerry and I to be on a be on a show where, the, where I can't even remember what the show. It was a studio show. And I don't remember quite what the purpose was, but it was to kind of kind of to, to maybe roll out Mark Zona, you know, and, 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 and we pull into the parking lot right next to him. He pulls up in his rental car. And he has a, a kind of a biker do rag on, you know, you know what I mean? Kind of like a Harley Davidson on his head. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it's the only time I think I've ever seen him, you know, in, in that particular kind of get up. I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe he likes to, likes to roll that way, you know, likes to ride, you know, he's born to ride, you know, kind of guy, you know, and um, we were very, we, we were, you know, kind of not real, sure about one another at that point is, is my is, is my opinion of it and until he started talking i said well obviously he's going to be able to handle this just fine because he's very smart and he knows he knows what's up you know having never set foot in the tv studio before he kind of knew right where to jump in and, and what to say and that was the first time i met him was in connecticut so he never you guys never spent any time together previous it was just like you two are working together and Let's yeah let her rip yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and then he came in and the next time i saw him uh they said we're bringing him in to to do you know where, where it was just you, me and jerry doing one of these posted shows you know well after the fact show i think it was from gunnersville and uh brought him brought mark zona in to do it and uh it was it was great i mean it was he was tremendous you know as you can imagine he was he was born ready <laughs> you know he was the old saying he's like boiled ham he's always ready <laughs> is I mean, you went from working with Jerry to Zona. I would feel those are two very, very different people. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, it was like it was like working with Winston Churchill, and then all of a sudden you're you're, you're working with Pat McAfee, you know, <laughs> a little bit, right? And and uh, you know, not quite that drastic, but yeah, it was it was a different it was a different thing. You had to had to keep up, and soon realize. And I think we talked about this the last time we talked. You know, I my role as the straight man to be the foil to his, his, uh, 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 energetic, you, you know, notions and new ideas and crazy jokes and whatnot and gags that he would bounce off, off the world. And, uh, you know, being there to help set that up was, was my role. And I was more than happy to play it and still am. Did you ever throw your career? I mean, because you are honestly one of the funniest dudes I know, like, you know, he and Zona go out <laughs> After a night and it, after a day of work and some of the greatest memories and you are one of the funniest dudes. But you ever battle that? Because I think that some, you know, in TV, that that's a battle for a lot of people to be the straight guy, to accept that. Like, I'm not going to be the Laurel. Oh, I'm going to be well, the Hardy. You, you, you've listened to it. Sometimes I try to sneak a, a joke in oh, or yeah. a nice crack here and there and everywhere. But that's that, that's sufficient to me. It's a, to me, it's it's way more important to to have the structure, you know, the way it's working right now, you, you, you have to have every look at every, 
you know, entertainment team that there's ever been. One is one is the is the is the the, the foil, and the other one is the one who who delivers the gag, you know. And and, and uh, you know, somebody's you, you have to have a straight line to play against the the crazy line in order for it to all work. And that's ah oh, shoot, that's there's no other way to do it. What are some of your favorite anglers that you've covered or favorite moments that you've covered in this sport? favorite moments that I've covered in the sport. I just, you know, just about every time we do Steve Kennedy, I, I just love it. He's just got a different energy, a, a different way of expressing himself that it is just so completely different from, from, from everyone else. It's, it's like, uh, it's, I don't know, you, you, you could probably describe it better than I could, but uh, I just love Steve Kennedy. I, I loved all of, you know, everything I can now. <laughs> It's everything over the top that he's done when he's landed a fish, uh, you know, you know, banging his head on the, you know, on the steering wheel and doing all that crazy stuff. I've, uh, I've loved all of that, but I, you know, I've always loved, uh, you know, uh, I get reminded of this on this project we're working now about the history of BASS, you know, well, we had Denny up hadn't, hadn't visited with Denny in a while and, and just all his, his, uh, you know, competence knowledgeable thing along with a real crustiness <laughs> and an irritability that 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 is is just makes him so so much fun to listen to you know that's that that's uh, other people you know uh, gosh uh, you know, gerald swindle of course all those guys and you know it's just it's terrific you know i'll listen i'm hold on i got some, something being delivered here but uh anyway you know that that's the deal there's okay. The mail. Merry Christmas. Oh, Mars. Merry Christmas. Wow. I didn't Bowman. mean to on show, but I, I, I was going to call you later anyway. Well, Merry now Christmas. he took care Merry of that. Christmas. All right. I, I, I guess Steve Bowman's done for the week. Yeah. So, Merry Steve Christmas on his way out. So there you go. <laughs> a little bonus from the, from the, the great Steve Bowman cameo. That's right. Show. Two hall of famers at once on, on camera. <laughs> Uh, but they, they, they've all it, just had great mind. You know, people for, for, from now, I, I just like Drew Cook's personality. You know, he's 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 irascible, too. You know, he didn't start out. He started out kind of meek, you know, and sort of like getting his feet, feet wet. And now he's, he's sort of, you know, <laughs> he tells it like calls him like he sees him and, you know, talks about this. I, I just, you know, it's it's I'm leaving out all the important ones, I'm sure. But I, that's who, I, who comes to mind immediately. Does it affect you in either way? Like the, I mean, obviously an Iconelli, a swindle people, some of those people you mentioned, there's times where you can hit just cruise control and let them roll. Um, oh yeah. Do, is, does it affect you? Like when it's a quieter angler, do you feel like you have to work harder or is your job the same regardless? I, I guess that the pressure is there to, to, to but also, you know, if they're, if they're a quieter person, you have to give them some more time to, to, to say something, you know, and, and not just try to say, okay, well, he's not going to say anything. So we're just going to keep talking over this guy right here. You know, that's, it's, I, I think you can read a lot from, from body language and, and eventually everybody gives you something good. Uh, most all the time. Don't you feel when you're doing it? Yeah. I, I think, I think, I think when I first started, I mean, even the show, um, there's times where I've thought before, oh, we'll do this and this will be hilarious or we'll do this and that. And and it almost never, you know what I mean? Like you just let it happen and let the, per and it's the same advice I give every angler, be who you are. And if who you are is a bounce off the wall, hyper dude that is, you know, overly excited about everything, be that. But if what you are is a quieter person or whatever, there's people that relate with all of those. I think that's the unique thing about, I mean, I think it's weird in fishing when you compare it to other sports. Like, I mean, you can't, I know you love golf. You can't, you can't talk to tiger. You can't, I mean, there's no. people that hold a shush sign. And meanwhile, yeah. we've got in our sport, you not only have to talk to us, but you have to be entertaining. You have to, you know what I mean? There's, there's a pressure from, if it's not even from us, that pressure is from, your family, from your partners, sponsors, you know, all the people that work with you oh, yeah. to deliver more. Um, you think that's fair for the anglers? No, it's very hard. I'd say, you know, you just not all, not only that, you have to be all that and you have to be catching them at yeah. the same time, because if you're not catching them, we're not going to see you anyway. 
you know, by and large, you know, unless it's day one, you know, so, uh, yeah, that's it. That's tremendous. You gotta, you gotta be the breadwinner. You gotta be the, the, the team captain and the, the strategist. And you also have to be the, the, the analyst and the play-by-play -play guy at some point yourself, you know, the whole time through, but that's what people want. That's what they demand. They want to, I'd rather hear their version of why they're doing something than certainly mine, you know, have you ever gotten into a situation with an angler over the years where you said something and they didn't like the way it was delivered? Oh, well, <laughs> what comes to mind is, is, a, is a person who had a name. He's not, he hasn't fished Bassmaster for a long, long time. And, and uh, uh, he, he, he had, had a middle initial or, or a, a front initial. And, and I just called him by the two words of his name and didn't put the front initial. And the, the next Monday we heard from his sponsor who said that uh, angler X is very, very disturbed that you did not say his, the initial that starts his name before you said the rest of his name. And I'll, I'll, I'll bet you can probably figure out. <laughs> yes, but he is very, very, you know, I just had no idea if uh, people can be very uh, protective of name, but I was, I was certainly, told to apologize to this sponsor and to that angler. And so I did, I did. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you and Zona love enough the time has passed. I can tell that story. Yeah. I mean, I mean, she, I think also that, do you believe, I believe in general, the world is a lot more honest than it once was in the way that, and I don't know if it's from social media, if it's from all the live different things, but I just feel like, it's okay to tell a lot of stories now but where people would be like, I can't believe you brought that up. Like just people, are they less offended? Do you think, or, or do you agree with me? I, I think they've just come to expect it. You know, back 25 years ago, you could, you could sort of cruise along and pick your spots and appear like a hero. The times that you were, you know, in the public eye, in the spotlight and, and, and everything else would, would slide, would slide away unnoticed. And now everyone knows that nothing goes unnoticed anymore. You know, you're, uh, what, what you, you don't have, uh, have fans, you have stands, stalker fans, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the people that consume everything you do because it's all laid out there because the pressure's on you to get it all out there all the time. So I think they just expect it. I don't, I don't know if they like it anymore or they're more agreeable to it, but uh, they know to expect it and, and they're smart. They, they sort of conduct themselves accordingly. You're working on a project. You mentioned it a few minutes ago, and I think it's one of the most important projects in fishing, but the cast, tell me about it. Oh, the cast. Yeah. Well, of course it, the, the thing about the cast was it was spurred too late by the passing of Ray Scott. I mean, what a, what a incredible person, uh, the, the, the main source for all this stuff that, that we do now that it is the Bass Angler Sportsman Society. So, uh, in the, in the wake of that, in the year after that, it was, it was, you know, everyone started thinking, wow, we really need to, you know, we, we've had a great sport up to now because most of the original guys were still around up until just a few years ago. And, and many, a few of them still are, you know, and, and, and we're thinking, well, well, they're, they're not, uh, many of them are not around anymore. And, and there's going to be a whole bunch of them not around. That's the way the world works. And so we need to get talking to these people and get the real story about what the world was like before, BASS, what professional bass fishing was like before BASS. So we started this project called The Cast, and I think we're coming out with seven or eight episodes of it to start the new year. Uh, starting in the new year, I don't know exactly which which date it starts on. And uh, the first uh, episode is a one hour episode where we take it from the very start, from back before beginning of BASS. From Ray, we, we take it from Ray's world what he was seeing right then and the people that populated it at that time were uh, primarily uh, a guy named Glenn Andrews, who was thought of as the guru of bass fish. He was the authority on bass fish. Everyone who wanted to get really good at it sought Glenn Andrews out. And we found Glenn Andrews in his nineties, still just as lucid as, as you can imagine and spent a day with him up at his home and got a, got a, got some great stories from him about the wild west world that was professional fishing he fished in the what they call the world series of fishing and he was the world series champion and all these crazy tournaments with all where they changed the rules on him because he was so good and he had to he had to have a fist fight with a guy who had bet on the tournament a fist fight back at the dock because this guy was out there 
messing with him with his boat while he was out practicing the day before the tournament started. So he had to had to had to fish with a cast on his arm uh, through the tournament and still won it, I think. And uh, and and Glenn is just great and 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 still, you know, and that and that's where it started. And then so to tell that story, uh, guys like Glenn, guys like Bob Cobb you know, who was right there from the beginning with Ray before the classic, all the things that happened before the classic, especially Bassmaster magazine and how that was different and still is for many other fishing publications. And uh, Bob is a great storyteller, of course, and, and did a great job. Helen Severe, who succeeded Ray, we got her in the room as well. And, and uh, uh, Jim Keats, who was, who was Ray's yeah. Uh, sort of assistant, you know, for so many yeah. of those. She gave us some great stories. One story in particular, I can think of when they were, they had gone to Iraq during the Iraq war to hand out rods and, and kind of do a tour around and promote fishing, wow. you know? And, and uh, so Jim and Ray were, had finished that tour. They were waiting there at the airport to get their ride out of Bagram or whatever air base they were at. And a big C one th- or C the big transport pulls up there. And a, a guy walks out and, in a kilt and bagpipes and starts playing. And then they start bringing out the coffins with the American flag draped them of all the, 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 the fallen soldiers who are going back home. And he talked about how much Ray was moved by that, you know, and how that really affected him and as it would anybody, but just stories like that, you know, to sort of flesh out Ray's world and why he was such a great, unique American. He was an only, only an America guy. He was, he was like Don King, you know, he had been, yeah. And, uh, and, and that's uh, the story of Ray is fascinating. It takes up most of that, that one hour, but great reminiscences from the likes of Bill dance and Hank Parker and Bobby Murray and people like that all telling his story. And, and, and then we, we, we take it up to the first classic and, and Bobby's whole account of that and all the things we never knew about that, that classic and, and about him winning it, why that was so improbable. And, and, and those, those first tournaments and, Johnny Morris talking about it. Johnny Morris was a part of that scene back then. He qualified for the first and the first couple three classics, I think, and uh, you know his story and, and how he got his giant mega business started with that group, basically as 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 the uh, you know the walking billboards for bass fishing and bass fishing tackle that he was selling through the mail at that time. It's a, it's a fascinating story, and 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 that that's the that's the kickoff, and it takes us up past the classic through the first first half of the seventies, you know, you know, and it's just, it's really, we have guys like Rick Klein and Hank Parker who, who, you know, fill us in so well on all of that. And of course it moves up. I I think through these seven episodes, we'll probably get, we'll probably get well into the nineties, maybe halfway, maybe halfway into the nineties because we have Denny or Larry Nixon and Davey, uh, terrific on it. You know, it's just always, we, we spent a long time with the likes of Dewey Kendrick, and Trip Weldon, you can imagine the things that Trip Weldon could tell. You know, you've worked with Trip for so many years, yeah. and he was, as you can imagine, just really great. And it's going to be interesting. It's going to be really good. Uh, it's something we're all real proud of. It's a very cool project. I, I look, I, I really look forward to seeing it. Um, I, I think, in general, we all forget how young. I mean, it our sport is. I mean, like yeah. like you mentioned, Rick Clun, and that's the amazing thing. This is going to be his fiftieth season this year. He. He's been there from the beginning, basically. Like to, that, I mean, as you age, do you look at Rick Clunn and be like, like, I don't think people really look and realize just, I mean, he's 78 years old. Like, it's incredible that he's still competing, still competitive today. He's, he's, he's so different. He's a miracle. There's just nobody like him. He, he has thrown off all the shackles that we have on us that prevent us from, you know, being in the game for, for forever and forever we we, we got to go sit down i got to hit the bench for a while i just i can't compete he's not bound by any of that stuff and and i we visited him up at his place uh his beautiful place way back in the woods and he he told us some great sta- uh, tales and including fishing i will say this fishing in the all together at one point the what? <laughs> not in a commercial i mean not not in a tournament but uh, uh in a in a very secluded place you know just seeing what it was like to be sans clothes while you fished <laughs> and i hope it makes it into the show so, uh, i don't i haven't please, I, please I don't clarify know where the this for me. because we heard a lot of stuff 
that, that we thought, oh, gosh, I wish we could use that, but I don't know if we can or not. George Cochran is a source of stuff like that. Well, <laughs> you can use it here, Tommy, just so you know. If it doesn't make it in there, this this particular show has no rule whatsoever. <laughs> well, I, I, that was one. You know, I, The others, I, I really do have to kind of tiptoe around and maybe get permission even to use use on your no holes barred nasty <laughs> naughty show that you run here Dave. that's what we are naughty very <laughs> very naughty um that show looks at the past of bass fishing and and what got us here and i think that's super important but yeah. what do you think the future of it is where do you see this sport 10 20 years from now gosh i, I see it changed some I think, you know, I mean, we're, we're seeing some changes now, the stuff we always talk about that's, that's got everybody up in arms, you know, one thing or another from, from year to year. And I, I, I you know, the business has changed. The, 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 the industry that is the fishing industry is changing. And I, I don't know how that's going to affect how anglers make it in this world, how they, how they go forward, whether who it's going to favor and who's going to, who it's going to be rougher on. Um, I, I I, I think TV if, if, that's a lot of talent, you know, people doing the TV show, not, you know, younger than me, of course, but uh, I, I don't worry about that too much. I think they're going to be able to, to take. And, and for the viewers, I think the viewers, well, the viewers get to make a lot of decisions, whether they choose to watch or not is going to define how some of these, some of these elements, whether they stay or whether they go, they're going to be the ultimate arbiters. If, if they don't watch, then, that will spur change, I think, by by a unanimous decision on the part of anglers, industry people, sponsors, and, and so forth. Where do you think it's going, Dave? Well, you're really good at turning questions. I mean, the, 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 I like how you do this. I mean, I realize <laughs> you're a very good at this. You you well, get into us and you give me kind of an answer. Then you're like, well, why do you just tell me your thoughts? But my well, thoughts that's are... That's what people really want. No, bull crap. No, um, I think uh, I think the tournament world I mean I think it's very strong I think it's just going to continue to evolve I don't believe the, the I believe we live in a very weird time right now like I mean and I think most times I mean civil, the fact that we fish for five biggest fish and we make such a big deal out of it is really weird in general like all of it's weird but I think that we live in a time where, and I don't know that it's ever been like this in the past, but the push for negativity sells to a certain extent. And and you see it in every sport. It's the, the sky is falling and, and it just seems to increasingly get more. So I think that there's a lot of people out there that say, this is going to change. That's going to change. It always has. It always has since day number. The cast will show you that. I mean, yeah. how this, oh, yeah the limits have changed and how the way a pro is perceived has changed. I mean, the fact that at one time Bob Cobb and Ray Scott had to fight the law to release fish. I mean, just, right. when you say that now, it just seems like Mississippi. That, that can't be even a real story. So I think it's going to constantly change. Yeah. But I think that it, it's, it's a special. It's never going to change for the people that love it. And it's always been no. that way. That, that's the great point. There's a certain percentage of the population who are, as we say in Arkansas, eat up with it, who cannot get enough of it, never will be able to get enough of it, no matter what the form of it is. Yet they still get to vote, you know, yeah. with what they watch more and what they watch less and and how they communicate with <laughs> with everyone in the in this world, in this culture that that Ray started, by the way, you know, and. Uh, yeah, you're right. That's a great point. It's it's always changed and it's it's going to change some more. It's never been without challenges and it's it's never you know, the the going has never been, you know, smooth and easy. Uh, the going is always tough and and shoot, fishermen will find a way to fish. Guys going to crawl a f crawl over an 8-foot chain link fish fence to fish if he's eat up with. It. And I and I think that we don't give the sport enough credit for how far it's come. You know what I mean? Like when you go to a Bassmaster Classic and you see 150,000 people go to a town to, to support and not fish, just watch, not fish the thing they love. They don't get to do that. They're just watching other people do it. And I mean, at least they get to watch it now with live. I mean, for a long time, it was just like they went out and 
came back and told regaled us with their stories. But it like to me, I think sometimes people got to look and be like, there's a lot of sports that would look at fit that probably look at fishing, look at the Bassmasters and scratch their head and say, how does, how is that a thing? Because it is amazing that, you know, the way it is, you look at the staging just in, in the time that JM took over weigh-ins. I mean, I think people forget it when ESPN owned it, they spent a lot of money, but if you look at those, if you go back to classics previous to 2011, the staging, the lighting, the, none of it is at that next level. Like it is literally right, right. just a small stage in the corner. It gets bigger and better every year. And and the weird thing is, and this seems to be coming pretty relevant pretty quickly when I have conversations with people. There's a lot of older people that say it's it's this is not good. This is going this way. But the young people, there's more young people fishing now than ever. And the one thing in mankind that is undefeated is youth. That's right. <laughs> it, it, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to bet on something, you bet on youth. It wins every single time. And the fact that there's that many high school kids, college kids, grade school kids fishing. When I was in school in, you know. Did I had a picture of Hank Parker in my locker? And I remember him, it was a toy, it was a hummingbird ad and he had the trophy over his head. He had won the classic and that was the picture that I had in my locker. And I remember people used to laugh at it and make fun of it. And now we just had a high school kid qualify for the Bassmaster classic. That. Like, and that's in, in my lifetime. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I think we, we, we sometimes in the drive for negativity, people forget just how, amazing what's happening in the sport of fishing is yeah that that's the way reporting is now reporting has to be about uh, you need to be fearful because you need to give us a hit not every day but every hour yeah you know? and so, so keeping people agitated is the whole purpose of of reporting and and and, and following news these days and that's so unfortunate it just it just uh, ruins it for a lot of people but that that's that's you're right dave that's the changes I mean, when you, you watch this cast thing and you'll see the, the 79 way in at the classic in a, in a parking lot, you know, with the stride, people walking across the, the parking street and, and putting the fish down on a scale that was obviously barred from the butcher shop down the street, you know, and, and, uh, and compare that to, to being in the, you know, the, the arena there in Fort Worth, you know, this brand new place is just, uh, you know, it's just the Dickies arena and, and the contrast is amazing. It's amazing how far we've come. Then. Yeah. And I think that gets forgotten. Sometimes people, oh, yeah. you know, it, and I get it, you know, back in the day. I mean, I love a lot of stuff I look back on too. Every that's just natural, but look where it's gone. Like, look at, I mean, it's just like the battle of, will there ever be a summer classic? Because no kids go to the classic when it's not in the summer. Look at that. I mean, let's not just take opinions. Let's just look at the numbers every year. The classic numbers go up and up and up. And that's, been since it's been switched to the winter i, I mean i love the fact that the summer yeah. classic there's there's things that i love about it but the classic is a much more important event in the sport fishing world today than it was 10 years ago than it was 20 years ago and absolutely i mean if you fighting those crowds at knoxville just trying to get into the the building yeah. for, for for a weigh-in or, or the other building for the expo you know it was it, you you thought you're never going to get there it was it was just way beyond any anything anyone expected. It was beyond capacity, and and, and I I just couldn't believe it. It's so good. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna play a little name game here with you. I'm gonna just okay. give you some names. Okay. You you can tell me a story. You can give me one word on them. Whatever direction you okay. want to go. All right. And I'm gonna start with uh, Jerry McKinnis. A hero, for me, and and. Um, you know, visionary. Absolutely. He was, he was there at the beginning of all that bass fishing stuff too, but he, he like Bobby Murray, like Bill dance, of course they fished some tournaments. He fished just a handful of tournaments, but he, he had a vision for it back then. And that's kind of still what we're unrolling for the world right now here in this building that he built. And uh, that's, that's Jerry McKenna's my inspiration. Bob Cobb. Bob Cobb, great storyteller. I mean, a, a guy who 
would had no quit in him, just like Ray, saw a way to to create something absolutely unique with with Bassmaster magazine and successfully beyond all yeah, expectations, did that and then turned his turned his uh, his talents to the TV, which he had no idea how to do, and got that done as well. To end, like we just mentioned, it's still many people's favorite era for Bassmaster Television. Bob Cobb, still relevant. Absolutely. You mentioned him already today, Denny Brower. Denny Brower, you know, so many tournaments, uh, 14 tournaments yet until he won that classic in 1998. He felt kind of like I'm not really a success. He really, really said it's never going to happen. I'm going to be, you know, forgotten. <laughs> And of course, that wasn't true. And then he then he won the classic, and and he's he's still a hero to so many people. Kevin Van Dam, Kevin Van Dam, the goat, the greatest of all time. Tournaments won, uh, second of course in Angler of the Year to to Roland. Four classics tied for the lead in that with Rick Klun, and uh, you know, someone who took took it where I I I didn't foresee it being taken. In the mid '90s, you could see flashes of that from him, but then, then he just, man, he waded out of the crowd and just started slaying every dragon out there. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a conqueror in the in the world of bass fishing. James Overstreet, James Overstreet, world's most interesting human, to, to be sure. Person who gets stopped by TSA way too much, you know, just because of how he looks. It's not fair. It's not fair at all. One of my favorite people. Uh, country in, in the most <laughs> endearing way <laughs> and uncompromising and a great, great artist as well. James Overstreet. Mike McInnes. Mike McInnes, unsung, super incredibly visionary, like his dad, very capable, probably a better organizer, probably better. At, at dealing with the people he works with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, no ego. I mean, no, 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 uh, you know, grandeur, you know, illusions of grandeur for him. He, he knows the job. He knows he can do it. He's supremely confident, but in a non-egotistical way and, and just super capable and, and creative. Very much so. Good. Yeah. It He's, um, I don't want to inject myself in this, but in my opinion, he needs to be in the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Oh, like absolutely. Mike yeah. McKinnis created live, like yeah. that alone, like the, the dream that his own father dreamt of one day live bass fishing. And, and he, he is the reason. I mean, I remember when he told the three of us, me, you and oh, yeah. Zoda, and we were all like, yeah, that, that'll <laughs> never work. <laughs> Yeah, one of those crazy ideas. Yeah, it's wishful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and he he's a detailed guy on top of all that. He attends to every little thing that's got to get done in order for that to happen. And he knows how to delegate the other things to people who are better than that, better at that than anyone else. Yeah. Davy Height. Davy Height, one of the greatest anglers of all time, to, for starters, a, an, an incredibly personable human being. And, and very, very good from the very first time he sat here at a tournament at Okeechobee and, and did the analysis. So different from Mark Zona, but so good, you know, so, just so, so solid and empathetic and, and, and you know, it's, uh, you know, experience to draw on that's, you know, uh, immeasurable. And uh, just, uh, 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 he's one of the, he's a Navy SEAL. He's like you and Mark Zona. Uh, I mean, you guys, you know, me and Ronnie and Such, we, we hang around here all day and deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. We don't we don't pay attention to one another. We take each other for granted. But you guys are the Navy SEALs who come in. Davy's one of them. Yeah. Mark Sona. The, the the original Navy SEAL who came in here full blown, ready to go, ready to be one of the the, the top. Uh, let's face it, sports analysts, not in fishing, but across the spectrum of sports. Uh extremely savvy. Uh, extremely good at reading people and knowing what excites them and, and knowing what they'll do, how they will react in a certain situation. Uh, 
a, a, an incredible mind for er, every detail of how a fish is caught, no matter where it is, what the situation is, and a, a, a tremendous <laughs> instinct for entertainment. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. I mean, he's you you, you always walk away from whatever Mark Zone is doing, watching it, wanting more. If you have to leave, you, you'd you'd rather stay, and I think that's the ultimate compliment. All right, I got another one, and this one's probably going to be the most difficult for you. Yeah, Tommy Sanders. <laughs> Tommy Sanders um, uh, tries to be prepared. Tries to have something every day. That's the the way you deal with maybe not having something fantastic every now and then. Is you try to have something at least semi solid every day, and and uh, you know enjoys it incredibly lucky above all and incredibly you know gifted with a cast of players in this endeavor that are beyond good that are all the superlatives the top of their craft so lucky is, is in a word here's my i'll just switch that out for one word lucky lucky yeah <laughs> i think there's more than luck involved but well, uh thank you Dave. You you are uh, you are incredible and uh, irreplaceable. So you're never going to retire, right? <laughs> no, I guess I didn't think I was. I mean, Mike and I said at the end in the last year, I said, "Okay, are you going?" I said, "Well, I, I guess if if you if you will have me, I'll I'll go." I said, "Are you going?" I, yeah, I'm I'm going to go. I said, "Okay, we'll just revisit it. Start a seven uh, 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 twenty four. Okay, and now we're all plugged into all these things. So I guess." I guess we're going for another year, but no, it's not good. Come on. Once again, I'm no Al Michaels, but, uh, you know, well, yeah, he as long fired. as I can feel You're useful, I'll, I'll keep doing it. But at some point, the natural order, I think you got to pass the torch. You got to, you know, one, one thing that I think we left out that you, you started to hit on the future of bass fishing. We've got more for young people than, than there's ever been available. Yeah. Than, than than ever before and, and way more each and every year i mean you had to you had to defend yourself on the little poster of hank hank parker and 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 scramble to find every little tidbit of fishing information they can they can jump into a whole world of it you know for better or for worse that's what the the the, the, the internet and social media allows us to do we've got way more for young people than we've ever had before and you know i think they, they probably would <laughs> Welcome seeing a younger face hanging out on these bass on these bass I, or broadcasts. I, I disagree. I, I think everybody loves seeing you there, Tommy. But um what what would you do if you retired? Like what what is That's what I'm asking? I mean, you know, I I'd, I'd play golf and you know, go travel a lot and go camping and fishing and hiking and golfing a lot and stuff like that but you know you never know i think people never know you know people who retire some of them just like falling off a log is perfect for them you know they're they're good to go and others kind of they're at sea they're they're lost a little bit they takes them a while and sometimes they never do figure out how to fill up their days you so can just it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a daunting thing for everybody i think um, youtube youtube is your future if you retire <laughs> i will pay well, I'll more. gladly I, subscribe to just watch you just like wherever you are, Florida Keys, walking along, commentate okay. on what you see. Okay. Well, just yeah. A I minute mean, of Tommy every day right now. I'm watching well, somebody scoop ice cream. You'll send me some shows that I can throw to. We'll just recreate the old ESPN outdoors format. And, you, know, <laughs> and we'll, you know, you can round up some shows and we'll, we'll just do a whole morning's worth every week. Sounds like a plan. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are, are you all set for Christmas? I've, no, no, I've still got Christmas shopping to do. I'm I'm enjoying a very nice wreath that I, uh, a nice family gave me. That's that's, that's very nice. That's, that's wonderful. But, yeah, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, I got work to do. What is your favorite Christmas tradition? My favorite was when I was like most people. It's from when I was a kid. Uh, my my dad would, you know, we'd we'd get up, we'd have the Santa Claus had left this or that for all, we'd play with our toys, but he'd get real tired of watching that. For after about 45 minutes we'd eat breakfast and we'd get and we'd go do something we'd go down to the bayou somewhere that he grew up on and maybe maybe even fish but just walk and be out there dig for arrowheads stuff like that we, we duck hunted you know on, on christmas mornings back in, in those certain seasons when you could we, we we'd play golf in 25 degrees one christmas morning that that was you know it was you know 
it got you away from all the trappings, you know, and, and, and into, you know, something different just to get your mind off something you've been ginning up in your mind as a kid for three weeks or three months, you know, in advance of Christmas. I, I, I was thankful for that. Do you remember like what, did you ever have that gift when you were a kid, like a red rider, you know what I mean? The red rider, BB gun, whatever. Like, do you have any of those memories of that gift you really wanted or, or even gave yeah. someone? I, I, I wanted a certain kind of bicycle, uh, back, back in the day, you know, and, and it was, it was kind of, it was, it was of course the, the expensive kind and there was a, a kid's type bicycle, you know, and, and, uh, I, I, it was unreal. I was unrealistic about it and got a perfectly good bicycle, but I remember being a little selfishly, you know, disappointed for a, for a brief moment there. So that's, yeah, that, <laughs> I bet we've all got our, got one like, but that, that was my one shiny object that I, that I really wanted so much, but I, I taught myself to get along with the other. <laughs> you? Uh, um, I had, yeah, I had some, I mean, it was a fish and reel. There was one fish and reel I really wanted at one time. And, and that was kind of my red rider BB gun when I was a kid and, and, I, just like the Red Rider BB gun, I didn't shoot my eye out with it, but I was thankful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, yeah. it's weird. Um, I mean, it's so funny. Like, as you get older, like, literally, all you want is time. Like, I just want time with people. With, yeah, you, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't a... care about gifts at all anymore. Like, it, it's I so like hard to, to get them. that time. You know, it's that's so precious. Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh, man. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a depressing direction to take it. I know how to yeah, pick really. this back up, though. We have, okay. we have something. It is a it is a tradition on uh, this show. We started it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I guess, this tradition. Um, and it's a new thing we do in the show called Ask a Qu Answer a Question, Ask a Question. So it started with David Fritz, and he asked a question to the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And then it went on to our next guest. Well, last week we had nine guests. They all answered the question. They were all the new rookies. Um, oh, yeah. that are coming. They all answered the question, but they're horrible at asking questions. So for this week's ask a question, we went to the viewers and I needed a serious answer to this, Tommy. And I thought this was one you'd enjoy. I mean, you, okay. I've asked you sure. some very traditional, boring questions. This is not, this question is who wins in a fight, a bald Eagle or a King Cobra. I say the King Cobra wins the fight. The King Cobra wins the fight because he has, has venom. And and we've heard, you know, we've, we've all the mongoose can kill the, the cobra and, and so forth like that. But the bald eagle, despite being our national symbol, the bald eagle is just not a fighter. You know, he's really not. He, he, he doesn't, he prefers dead stuff. He'd rather go pick up a dead coot than, than fight a live goose for sure to get something to eat. Uh, he, you know, he loves flying over birds on the water and scaring them, but he doesn't ever, he rarely, you know, he, you know, once in a while he'll snatch a, he'll snatch a fish out of the water if the fish is not doing too well, which is why it's on top in the first place, probably. But I, I say for, I say for, uh, no fear, the Cobra, the Cobra wins that. Okay. Now right. very un-American of you. Huh? Maybe, yeah, maybe I will have a hard time yeah. working with you. Wow, Tommy Sanders really hates America. <laughs> Not really. Me, me over street and Davy Height were in a subway last year or whatever. And the the, the lady says to Davy's ordering his sub, the lady says, What kind of cheese? And he says, American. And Overstreet turns to me and he's like, what other kind of cheese you think Davey Hyde orders? That's good. That is good. Let him get his hat, lady. What kind of cheese do you think? Exactly. Yeah. Tommy, one of my favorite holiday traditions that happens in our house is every year, doesn't matter how, how big and old my children get, they have me read the night before Christmas to them before they go to bed. Huh. And um, I've always told you, I, I I mean, we did some Dr. Seuss, I think the last time you were on this show. We, we did. We did the, what one fish you, 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 you trotted out one fish, two fish. And we did. Yeah. 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 It was a big hit. People loved it. Oh, really? um, and I thought for this, our festive special, you could read 
the night before Christmas. Oh, wow. Clement Moore's The Night Before Christmas. And that's not the name of it, by the way. Point of trivia. Wow. What is it? The name what? of it is A Visit from St. Nicholas. A oh, Visit wow. from St. Nicholas, popularly known as The Night Before Christmas. All right. So, Do you, do you happen to have a reading. copy nearby? Uh, oh, here's one right here. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You ready? I, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy. All right. Put yourself in that place. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds with visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter that I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window, I flew like a flash, I opened the curtains, and threw up the sash, and the moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes did appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick i knew in a moment he must be saint nick and he whistled and shouted and called them by name now dasher now dancer now prancer and vixen on comet on cupid on donder and blitzen to the top of the porch the top of the wall now dash away dash away dash away all when they meet with an obstacle like leaves before the wild hurricane fly when they meet with an obstacle they mount to the sky so up to the housetop, the coursers, they flew with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas, too. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the, the pawing and prancing of each little hoof. And I, I drew in my head and was turning around and down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. And the bundle of toys he flung on his back and he looked like a peddler just opening his sack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the stump of a pipe he held right in his teeth, and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself, a wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings and turned with a jerk. There's more. <laughs> and laying a finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney, he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, there he drove out of sight. Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. That's the visit from St. Nicholas, Dave. <laughs> Tommy Sanders, you are incredible. You are uh, a gift to our sport. And I believe you have just recited a new holiday tradition for bass fishing fans all around the world. They will listen to Tommy Sanders what, what is the name of it again? It's not a night before it's a Christmas. visit from St. Nicholas. A visit, a visit from, from St. Nicholas. From St. Nicholas. Yeah, that's the actual name of the poem. Clement Moore. All right. Back in the day. It was a beautiful rendition. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I, I'm, a, I'm a ham from way back, so you've known that all, all along. I love that stuff. Tommy, you, uh, you're one of the people, like I said, I said before I did the show, one of the people who I love to talk to the most, and I appreciate you spending time time with me uh, and uh, and our viewers here this week. And Merry Christmas. Thank you. The feeling is mutual, Dave. I love every time I get to visit with you and we don't get to visit enough. But thanks for having me on the show today. What a way to finish a festive special. I could listen to Tommy Sanders read anything. And I love listening to him read The Night Before Christmas or, or whatever the actual name is. Um, I just know it as The Night Before Christmas. But thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Aaron Yavorsky. And thank all of you for, for making this show 
an actual thing. I mean, this is honestly something I look forward to. It's one of my favorite things that I get to do. I mean, not just because I get to have conversations with amazing people, but because I get to share them with you guys, because I get to communicate with you guys. You guys have made this show and this community something very, very special, and I cannot thank you enough for that. Um, next week, I'm off. Um, it's the only week I take off all year in between Christmas and New Year's, so there will be no show next Wednesday. But maybe, I mean, sometimes we put... I mean, Actually, maybe it'll be something up. So check up next Wednesday. Disregard what I said. But we will not be recording a show. But I will tell you this. You guys have made this something. And I'm going to do everything I can to continue to make this bigger and better than it's ever been. And um, we have some guests booked for 2024. They're already lined up and ready to rock. And trust me when I tell you, the upcoming guests are incredible, incredible guests. Some of the who's who of the fishing world and uh, some of the most interesting people in the fishing world. And I hope you all enjoy it. So have a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, a Happy Hanukkah, or whatever you celebrate. Happy Holidays to all of you. I hope you spend it surrounded by family, surrounded by loved ones, and surrounded by happiness. As always, enjoy being, and for the final time in 2023, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?